be dropped. There are concerns that oil wealthy countries are pushing to maintain fossil fuels. We cannot afford this time. An urgent mitigation for real emissions has been your call, not geoengineering. Thank you, Pat. I want to move now on to Sarah Olsen. Sarah is a former Greenlandic politician. From 2011 to 2014, she occupied one of Greenland's two seats in the Danish Polka team. Sarah was the first woman elected to lead the Inuit Atakwat, this is challenging me, Atakwat political party and has been the Vice Premier and Minister of Social Affairs, Family, Gender Equality and Justice in the Government of Greenland. She was previously the UNICEF Head of Program in Greenland and now she serves as the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Is the sound on? Thank you. That was better. First of all, I want to thank uh, the uh, Quaker UN office and other uh, co-organizers of this side event for joining forces with the Inuit Circumpolar Council in in uh, organizing this important focus on climate justice. It is an issue that uh, we from the Inuit Circumpolar Council have been raising now uh, and focused on for some years. And I would like to use today's side event to present to you uh, the uh, protocols that we have developed as part of that focus on equitable and technical engagement uh, with Inuit. There are some copies of the pamphlet here and the full version is to be found online. And before I go deeper into presenting the protocols, I would like to say a little bit about why they have been important and why we have worked on, on developing these protocols. Um, there's eight points, main points that we have in, in the document. And also a little bit about what we are bringing to this part as our most important messages, uh, as we've just heard. Uh, it is our homeland that is one of the and tell about the climate change and therefore we are also here at this COP27 saying and having bringing the message that uh, an Inuit and Arctic reality is now a global reality. ethical engagement. We did so because as peoples of the Arctic, as indigenous peoples of the Arctic, many of us live in societies that went through colonization, that went through uh, the effects of people coming in from the outside with their own knowledge systems, with their own world, with, with other power relations that have deeply affected our societies both uh, on a mental level, but also on physical and, and all other levels. Uh, and with that actually, comes... Is ready. Uh, We are taught that the knowledge that we gain from a Western schooling system is the true knowledge. And we don't oppose that, but what we are saying is our indigenous knowledge, our knowledge as Inuit, is just as valuable and equal to, to the Western science. It is important to have that in mind and have that in the forefront of collaboration with Inuit to make sure that we end the colonial approaches to wanting to engage, engage with us. We have seen decades of polar explorers, scientists and people that wanted to have 
Nath and Fjord's named after them, coming into our homelands, leaving again without leaving any value for us, other than the knowledge of a people living in the Arctic. So, we need to make sure that in the years to come, institutions and forums, scientists, businesses, everyone who comes to the Arctic engages with us in an equitable and ethical way. And tokenism, and where one ego is in the panel, then you can say, think you can say you've engaged with us, or end applications to big funds uh, for research projects and have one ENO co-sign but not co-produce the design of the research or take part in formulating the research question and the end the deficit-based approach to us meaning that people come from the outside thinking that their knowledge is the true knowledge to make all of this happen we developed our protocols and just briefly going through them, they of course include the uh, words we have repeated for so many decades. Mm -hmm. We recognize indigenous knowledge in its own right. Thirdly, practice good governance. We have seen a lot, a lot of bad governance as formerly and continuously colonized peoples. Communication with intent, exercising accountability and building trust with us, and building by doing that meaningful partnerships. As the seventh, we mentioned information and data sharing and focus on the ownership and permissions. How many facts that we see in scientific when Inuit quote is quoted without the name of the person? Or that knowledge is included from the local community and the people without references? Again, our knowledge is equally as valuable and must be recognized. And finally, to equip and equitably fund Inuit representation and knowledge. So I welcome you to look closer at our protocols and support us in making sure that they are implemented with all that want to engage with the Arctic and with us. Just to touch a little bit deeper on the issue or the concept of indigenous knowledge. We see it as a systematic way of knowing a systematic way of thinking applied to phenomena across biological, physical, cultural, spiritual systems. It includes evidence and is intergenerational, meaning that it's living and it includes knowledge that was passed down from generations from before us. But it is also knowledge acquired today and in the future. So it is a living knowledge that is not only Define. All of the things that I have just said here is also what we understand as a human rights approach to science, to climate change. Because we are the humans that are deeply affected by climate change and it affects our identity, our culture, our way of living, as you have probably heard many times. So we need this shift in paradigm to understand the true meaning as we see it as a human rights approach as an approach to how we co-produce knowledge Hello. on an equal basis. And I would like to end okay. with another recommendation that we have brought with us uh, to the COP27, and that is very deeply connected to all the things that I've just said, as it is urging the governments to recognize the false dichotomy between developed and developing. To think in developed and developing, we see as one of the hierarchical, colonial way of thinking of the world, putting people into boxes that do not match reality. Here at this COP, there's a lot of negotiations and, and focus on how is the 
the, the, the funds going to be distributed around the world. Very much of it is talked about to be distributed from the north towards south. But we live in the north. And we are also uh, communities that have challenges in different ways and experience the colonization in, in ways in which makes it necessary for us to make sure that some funds are also flowing our way. So we urge to, to recognize the false dichotomy of developed and developing and recognize that any knowledge, any in people, and any, any uh, way of living is equal and should be recognized in its own right uh, in the way that, that we are talking about justice today, uh, both in regards to loss and damage, but also in, the, in, in, the, in, in regards to production of knowledge. Thank you so much, Sarah. I want to highlight the word colonialism that she has brought into her presentation and how much that is part of what is happening now in the raping and destruction of our environment and the healing that is needed. And thank you for your equitable and ethical protocols. I hope we could put them into our final decision at the COP. I'm moving over from Greenland to the Sami Council. We have Susanna Ilmers Israelson, who is an experienced youth Sami advocate and previously served as both Vice President and Union Secretary of the Swedish Sami Youth Association, Sami Nora. On behalf of this organization, she has represented the Swedish Sami youth in meetings and conferences with politicians at both international and national level. Susanna has been with the Sami Council since 2021 and currently serves as an Arctic and Environmental Unit Advisor. Thank you, Susanna, for joining us. Thank you so much, Ito, and thank you everyone for being here. And also, thank you for inviting the Science Council to, to participate in this side event. Uh, my name is Yusana Israelson, and I'm working at the Sami Council, which is an indigenous people's organization in Sakmi that represents Sami civil society and our member organizations in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Russian Federation. I come from the people of eight seasons. I've grown up with the reindeer husbandry at center, which is a core part of Sami culture. And I would like to share some examples from Sapmi, our current situation, and why time and justice in Sapmi is so important. So as we all know, climatic disasters are increasing in frequency and severity. It is accelerating the intensity of wildfire, flooding, mounting permafrost, extreme heat events, droughts, and rising sea levels in indigenous peoples' traditional territories, resulting in evacuations, displacements, cultural and economic losses, and emotional stresses. And we're not only talking about physical losses of lands, but also the cult cultural losses directly connected to those lands and waters that constitute our identity. This threatens cultures, livelihoods, health, and the overall well-being, and these impacts are societal. So indigenous peoples globally, but also in the Arctic region, are already experiencing irreparable damage to languages, knowledge systems, and livelihoods due to loss of lands, biodiversity, and ecosystems. Losses that are non-economic and economic. In fact, according to the IPCC in their latest assessment report, assessments of non-economic losses and damages, including loss of societal beliefs and values, cultural heritage and identity, is lacking, and aggregate losses and damages would be higher if such values were considered. We talk about the 1.5 limit here in the climate negotiations, but we have already passed that in the Arctic and we are facing a region we don't recognize. In Safmi, my homeland, the seasons are changing. 
and therefore causing severe challenges to Sami culture and livelihoods. A classic example from my culture is our many words for describing snow conditions. Thanks, Dave. We have, um, we have over 300 words, words only, for snow and snow conditions. Everything I personally know about how to read and describe my environment, weather conditions, and their specific impacts on reindeer husbandry and other seasonal activities is connected to the reindeer husbandry. But as snow conditions are changing throughout Sapmi, so is our language too. And our rangers struggle to find food in their natural environments, and some starve in nature due to these climatic events resulting in ice on the ground, and herders are struggling to keep herds alive. And now, as a double burden, we lose our lands for the sake of mitigation and developments covered under labels such as green and sustainable. We have to prepare for the change that is coming from a changing climate, but at the same time also from the impacts of the change in land use and the loss of lands that we did not consent to. Deforestation, excessive exploitation of mineral resources and industrial developments all together are direct threats to all cultures existence in Sahmi. We cannot talk about mitigating or adapting to climate change in the Sami context without talking about other developments going on at the same time, as if everything happens in silos. A study published recently highlights that there's only 4% of reindeer grazing areas that are now untouched from activities, industrial activities, such as forestry, mining, also tourism, roads and railways in the three Nordic countries. And I wish to quote a ranger herder active in the Finnmark area in northern Norway. Quote, Our geographical area for adaptation is shrinking, which means we also lose the possibility to adapt. End quote. Stress and depression due to uncertainty regarding, for example, the status and future of ranger husbandry as a livelihood is a health issue within Sami society. Climate change then trying to adapt to constantly shrinking lands with increased costs and financial pressure related to adaptation measures adds a heavy burden on our communion. This has shown to reduce psychosocial health and include increased suicidal thoughts among herders. So the impacts are societal. Lands our cultural landscapes. It is to what our knowledge, identities, values, and well-being are tied to. And healthy and productive ecosystems, both on land and in water, are the basis for our culture and livelihoods. Threats to these are altogether threats to identity, values, and cultural practices, and therefore also the possibilities to pass these on to future generations. This cannot be quantified nor monetized and the threats we stand in front of have severe and detrimental effects on the well-being of our communities, possibly for generations. So therefore, Arctic indigenous peoples need to be part of the decision-making to broaden the dialogue and understanding of climate change and related impact in the Arctic, but also the urgency to avert development, creating and enhancing maladaptation and loss and damage. I especially want to underline the need to discuss land rights and colonialism, which have been and continue to be drivers of climate change and damage to our ecosystem. Indigenous peoples we have always adapted to our national environment, and our knowledge is key for resilience. Current developments in the Arctic make it absolutely crucial to recognize the connection between measures for mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage, especially constrained possibilities for adaptation, becoming maladaptation, coming from loss of land, changes in ecosystems, pollution, and restriction. So in short, 
Recognizing, understanding, and addressing realities are to indigenous people's experience and stand in front of, but also the drivers to leave. It's critical for understanding how to achieve climate resilience long term and for climate justice in the Arctic. But most importantly, this requires rights-based approaches and Arctic indigenous people to be equitable partners in these conversations and decision making. We talk about intergenerational equity, but Arctic indigenous people's values, knowledge, and how we understand and interact with nature, as we have done for millennia, is intergenerational equity embodied. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, from the people of Eight Seasons. Susanna has given us a very strong storyline of loss and damage. We often think of loss and damage in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, but loss and damage is everywhere. And in the Arctic, it is particularly key, the stories to understand what seems so far away to many people. And thank you for talking about maladaptation, mal mitigation and the importance of rights-based approaches for people living there, for nature and people to be protected. We have two more speakers, but before we go to our virtual speaker, Doha, I'm brought in very briefly. We have our, we have another indigenous voice here who is going to talk about, when we talk about mal-mitigation or mal-adaptation, she's also going to talk about geoengineering, and climate engineering tests, how they have been affected in these communities, and how we have a danger signal there. I want to introduce Pangang Pungowi. She is an indigenous mother from the civil gang located in Dina lands in the so-called Anchorage, Alaska. She is a tribal leader and a healer, justice and advocacy voice in the indigenous environment network and works on climate geoengineering, organizing for concerns. Thank you so much for joining us briefly and then we will move to our virtual. Now it's working. Wanga aka bangawi na naka bangawi, wanga adaka agnatuma naka kirsten nuwa pas. I come from the walrus people. Uh, we're called the walrus capital of the world. And I also come from a land with a history of peoples who have always had things done to us, on us, and for us without our permission. Experimentation and poisoning by the military and government. We live in a cancer cluster and are considered some of the most polluted people in the world. And now climate mitigation like geoengineering testing is being attempted by the academic institutions driven and backed by billionaires and fossil fuel interests. Climate change is not possible without designated certain lands and people as sacrifice zones. The ability for us to over emit is so grossly is due to the treatment of black, indigenous, and people of color communities as less than a human. This is also true for geoengineering. Already geoengineering tests have been conducted or attempted on our lands, waters, skies, soils, and forests without free prior and informed consent. ICE 9-11, now known as Arctic Ice Project, deployed football fields worth of synthetic silica hollow glass microspheres to attempt to thicken the ice in the Arctic without free prior and informed consent of the tribal government and community members of Utkalvi. The project was founded by Leslie Field, who had spent decades before this contracting with Chevron. Scopets of Harvard University attempted to deploy weather balloon testing over Sami territory without the free prior and informed consent of the indigenous peoples. This project is funded by Bill Gates and would support research for a technology meant to spray sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. The Sami have stood up and said no to this project, and now scholars such as David Keith, John Moore, and Matthias Reese of the Carr Center for Human Rights claim it is unethical for the Sami to do so. The existence of racism means that Western trained scientists and Western institutions who often have the power to develop climate, global climate policy 
believe that indigenous peoples are simple-minded and do not understand science. It also means they have an unconscious bias toward Western values and Western priorities. Their internalized supremacy rooted beliefs lead them to argue that indigenous peoples do not have the right to say no to geoengineering testing, even if it is done on our own lands, waters, bodies, and air. Their internalized superiority leads them to sincerely believe that their interests are global interests and should therefore supersede the rights of indigenous communities to sovereignty and free prior and informed consent. We are here to tell you that as indigenous peoples, we have an inherent understanding that the commodification of life has failed us, including that which is permitted through carbon offsets biodiversity offsets, and other market-based mechanism schemes used to prolong the fossil fuel era. We have an inherent understanding that the testing of single-dimensional research areas like feasibility and short-term ingestion toxicity in laboratories is simplistic. You cannot predict how large-scale deployment of carbon reduction and solar radiation management will impact complex interdependent economic ecosystems. Testing whether a material will thicken the ice does not consider how spreading materials over 100,000 square kilometers will impact life system within that ice, which depends on sunlight and the delicate freeze and melt cycle of the Arctic. Indigenous peoples are not permitted to give adequate intervention on the subject within the framework of our own belief systems. We wade through scores of academics, institutions, and policy makers who try to suck us into irrelevant debates, such as the pros and cons of geoengineering. We are not here to debate this. We are here to assert the relevance of our own cosmovision, our own science, and our own tribal sovereignty and rights. These policy makers and academics have no understanding of their own histories and patterns of violating land rights, tribal sovereignty, and our right to true consent. We have protected 80% of Earth's biodiversity with our blood. Geoengineering is a sign of industrial desperation. It is the swan song of an extraction-based economy which has always been doomed to fail. Geoengineering testing is a form of unjust deployment and experimentation on indigenous peoples without their free prior and informed consent. The deployment of such technologies at scale could only ever be a form of testing. The impact would be cataclysmic. The only true answer is to heal our relationship with each other and the sacredness of Mother Earth and to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Thank you so much for being here. I know you had a press conference, but I just want to say thank you for coming and giving us these examples of what's happening on the ground. Can you just repeat what you were saying? You had a phrase that geoengineering is industrial desperation. Geoengineering is industrial desperation. And the extractive industry, extractive economy. Thank you. And as we all know in this room, what is happening at the COP is shifting away from real reduction of greenhouse gas, transforming the root causes Instead, we are seeing more and more push for those people who want to carry on with fossil fuels and somehow pump it into the ground for the next generation to have to deal with. Thank you so much. I'm Doha on virtual. You have been so patient for us. Our last speaker before we open for questions. Our last speaker, Doha Abdel Motal, is Egyptian, but she is not speaking here in Egypt. She is abroad. She's um, a professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute and a professor of Alana who is helping us today. Um, Doha is an agriculture, environment, and climate expert with over 20 years of national and international experience. She has worked with the Egyptian Environmental Affairs Agency and the World Trade Organization. She has been chief of staff of the International Fund for Agriculture Development and worked at the food, World Food Program. And she's the author of Antarctica, The Battle for the Seventh Continent. Doa is going to talk to us about something called the Cold Rush. And we hope that you appreciate this special moment. Thank you. Doa. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Very good. 
Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me uh, with you, and I hope the technology holds until I uh, give this very, very brief uh, talk. Um, climate justice is the prism, uh, or is our prism today. Now, the concept is complex, since within that concept, there are many different competing interests, all of which impact what you have called uh, in this talk, the cold rush that is taking shape. And what is meant by the cold rush is uh, the competition for the Arctic, its resources, its shipping lanes, all the attempts that we're now seeing to rebrand the Arctic, the work of the Arctic Economic Council, and so on. Climate justice is a concept that not only has environmental implications, but it has social, economic, and political consequences as well, sometimes turning it into a challenging concept to work with. Now, justice is often associated in this particular context with affording minorities certain rights, minorities such as indigenous people, giving them a voice, whether on climate matters or on any other issue to do with their livelihood and well-being. In that sense, I have to say that the indigenous people of the Arctic are very fortunate relative to other indigenous groups that I have worked with around the globe because seven of the eight Arctic states are well-established democracies within which indigenous people's concerns are taken into account through a variety of different approaches. Indigenous people in at least seven of the eight Arctic uh, nations can make their voices heard. Um, there are, um, uh, they are given a voice in, in many different ways. There's some Arctic countries have indigenous people's parliaments and so on. Uh, but uh, the rights of indigenous people also derive from a number of international instruments like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People or ILO Convention 169. Second, I would say that the indigenous people of the Arctic are also fortunate because of the Arctic Council, which unfortunately is an institution that is now sort of withered away with, uh, with ongoing geopolitical developments. But the Arctic Council, which is the main intergovernmental forum for cooperation on Arctic matters, gives six indigenous peoples groups permanent participant status. So they have, while they have no right to vote within the Arctic Council, that the right to vote is reserved to the eight Arctic states, they have the right to participate in all meetings and activities, they have the right to present proposals, and they do sit side by side with ministers of the Arctic Eight. Now, one of the issues that demonstrates, in my opinion, just how complex uh, the concept of environmental justice more broadly is, uh, was the experience within the Arctic uh, with the EU ban on seal products of 2009. The EU had banned seal products for reasons to do with animal welfare. The ban was strongly contested uh, by uh, the Inuit community and by various indigenous groups up in the Arctic, and in the end, the EU ended up introducing an exception for hunts conducted by indigenous people and by the Inuits to its regulation. Now, what that case demonstrated, in my view, uh, are um, a number of points which I believe apply across the board to environmental and climate justice. One is that what is environmental justice for some is injustice for other communities. Uh, and this was certainly the inward perception at the time of the EU ban on seals, which was applied uh, based on animal welfare concerns. Two, that environmental activists from outside the region, from outside the Arctic, can often have a very different agenda and different priorities from, act from actors within the region, including from environmental activists within the region. And three, that environmental justice interacts with economic, political, and many other rights. In the case of the EU ban on seals, uh, many Inuit and indigenous communities felt that their food security would be endangered by the ban. Their traditional way of lives, uh, many of them wear uh, seal fur um, uh, to warm themselves in winter. So it was also an attack on traditional ways of life and culture. Now, this uh, the EU seal ban was not an isolated episode, but I think it's a very powerful example because it demonstrates how uh, concepts of environmental justice can differ across regions. Um, 
But I remember, uh, I recall very well in 2014 when I interviewed one of the former prime ministers of Greenland, Aleka Hammond, in the context of research that I was doing, she spoke to me in the strongest possible terms against a Western framing of environmental issues and priorities in the Arctic. In fact, her first words to me uh, in the interview that I conducted was that she was very tired uh, of going to conferences on the Arctic only to find pictures of the Arctic fox of um, uh, of the polar bear up on PowerPoint uh, screens. She wanted to see pictures of the Arctic people, of people living within the Arctic Circle whose needs needed to be met. And I remember very well her powerful words to me about the Arctic not being a museum and about Arctic people wanting development just like the rest of the world. She was also not shy in talking to me about some of the benefits and opportunities that lay for her country, Greenland, in climate change. Uh, she spoke specifically about climate tourism and how she was seeking to promote climate tourism, which may come as a shock to the audience in this conference, but she wanted to make sure that as many tourists were flowing into Greenland as possible to watch glaciers melt because it was a source of revenue for a lot of the uh, inhabitants of Greenland who uh, suffer from a short lifespan, poor health care, and many other issues that require economic growth. Now, we may agree or disagree with her views, but what is important from a climate justice prism is for the full diversity of views and interests to be heard as the so-called cold rush goes forward, and for us to be aware of the dangers of speaking on behalf of other groups. Climate justice is and will always be a negotiation, and in the end, it's also in the eye of the beholder. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Doa, and thank you, Chris, for richly coming in and being patient with the technology and, and also helping us remind ourselves of the ability to participate in a democratic country versus those that are not democratic, what that means, but also being aware, as you said, that people may have the right to participate, but not to vote is still not an equal position. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you and just talk for a minute or two about what you've heard and any questions that you'd like to raise before we open for questions. So just take a stretch, turn to someone next to you, say hello and see if there's something that came up that you want to talk about. If I can bring you back, I would love to see some hands to ask some questions. I see two hands already. Um, can I start with you at the front, and then the man with the beautiful hat, and then the woman with the purple and black? Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Megan and I'm from Maine, Sandwich, which is in the uh, Labrador, Canada, and one of the Inuit regions so. And I have a question. Um, as leaders in climate justice, how do you see or how do you vision like the replacement of including indigenous perspectives with actually implementing indigenous policies? 
I'm going to let our speakers go directly to that question. Like Susanna. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How do you see or vision um, replacing, including indigenous perspectives, with actually implementing indigenous policies? So instead of having an indigenous person on a board to hear their perspective, actually behind the scenes implementing indigenous policies. So it's more than just what people see to make organizations feel good. <laughs> how, I, how I envision it to happen? Or if you see it or how you envision it, yes. Um, I'm afraid I, I I I must say that I I don't see that happening actually in, in our current development at, at least in Sapia I, I think we are far from that reality. That is something that is a major concern for us. We have these new developments and new um, goals and targets and, and legislation coming from the EU on on just resource extraction and, and so. I'm sorry, I, I cannot actually answer how I envision um, indigenous people's policy being part of that. Sami Council is, is working uh, really hard, um, of course, on, on affecting these policies and cooperating with, with the EU in certain levels. But we have a lot of work to do, um, I must say. Yeah. And also, Doha, if you want to make a point, can you put up your hand so I can see a yellow hand? Thank you. Thank you. I think we are back to the issue of uh, a human rights approach, because a human rights approach would also be to recognize indigenous people's right of self-determination, our right to participate in decision-making, and that is also why these are done, to guide people who come from the outside to how to make sure that they actually follow the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which recognizes us as peoples equal to all other peoples. So it has taken decades and decades to get to that point. And that's also the point we are raising from the Inuit Circle Council that because of the pressure coming from climate change, now also from the geopolitical reality of the world and especially in the Arctic, it was mentioned that seven of the Arctic states are democratic nations, uh, of course that means that there's one state that has now initiated a war on another state. We have Inuit living in Russia. We are a people that live across borders, but we are not recognized fully as a people. So. I think that, that it all comes down to the understanding and recognition, form of recognition of our right of self-determination as the peoples we are. So uh, this, this also leads me to one of the points I, I, I to, some agree, to some degree understand where the notion of an Arctic indigenous peoples being more fortunate than others comes from, but it does mean that the hardships of having been colonized and the emotional, mental, physical stress that comes from that is not a reality for us. It is, and therefore our alarms are ringing very loud in times like these. Because when the whole world suddenly has its attention on our region, both because of climate change and because of the geopolitical situation, it makes it more difficult for us to be there at the table. We talked about you, there was a mentioning about the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council right now on pause is a huge, huge risk of us losing the table to which we have been hooking on to. You know the Arctic Council came out of the idea of indigenous peoples. We were the co-founders. We brought those states together around a table, but we don't have voting rights. We wanted to have voting rights right from, from the beginning, but also there we see a movement towards a West Indian way of viewing the world that doesn't recognize us as the peoples we are. So to talk about justice and, and also 
yes, the good things about the Arctic, uh, there are many, many good things about Arctic governance structures, many different self-government agreements and, 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 and constitutional arrangements. But it doesn't mean that we are not going through some of the same struggles as we see other indigenous peoples and colonized peoples from around the world. And that is why we do not want new forms of colonization to be imposed on us. Um, so, so yes, um, it all boils down to self-determination and the recognition of self-determination by anyone who comes from the outside and wants to partner with us. Thank you, Sarah. I have the gentleman here for the next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Inusa and uh, I'm from the colonial border between uh, Nigeria and Niger Republic and uh, I think my question has been highlighted in the last uh, answer and I just want to reiterate that we cannot talk about climate justice without talking about uh, colonization and uh, coming from that angle of the world where the culture is being stolen the education system is being, uh, uh, how can I put it, it's been like, yeah, we're giving you education, the Western education is the education, not considering that our own uh, languages and uh, values are also more important to, to, to our people and not recognizing that one has left out in a bad shell that you must go to the school before you are considered illiterate and uh, before you are considered uh, someone that has a uh, that is educated and uh, i think this are all uh issue of which will lead to the issue of human right uh, climate justice is a human right uh, uh issue and i think uh Yes, we, we, we have to be, we need some transformation, we, we don't have, while making the decision, I think we, we have to look into, as you say, <coughs> not repeating the same mistake, or not, uh, we, we shouldn't be colonized in, 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 in other ways, because the world is going on transition, the economy, the wars, the, the defending, and uh, all these things are happening at the same time, and uh, we are all here to find some decisions and solutions, and uh, why uh, at the same time all the giants are looking into how they can push their economy and, uh, and, and how they can also try to maybe impose some, some kind of new 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 colonized systems that we especially the Africans can adopt where we don't have any strong democratic uh, structures to to depend ourselves on that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Francesca because you say climate justice is human rights justice. One of the things we're waiting for is to find out if human rights, rights-based approaches, climate justice will be in the language of this charmel shaped decision. And the concern that so many states still see human rights as some kind of bogeyman. Why? When it is their people. So I'm just going to bring over to Francesca briefly. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for this intervention. We're really much on point. And actually, there, there's a lot of thinking, especially in big international uh, NGOs, about how we decolonize the way we work. Uh, and I think everything that we heard in this panel is very much about that. So really ensuring that we get the, the actors that are at the front line of climate action, of social justice, and we really up, uplift them uh, so that um, organizations like CL and others that maybe interact more easily with big institutions, the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly in New York, can really make the space for these solutions from the ground to be heard and included in the solutions. And back to the human rights-based approach to climate, 
again, as usual, uh, there's a big uh, pushback by many parties in including meaningful uh, human rights language in the decision texts. And that goes beyond the mere understanding that climate change affects human rights. I mean, this is established, science tells us, the IPCC has more and more uh, acknowledgement that human rights are affected by climate and needs to be at the center of climate action. But the problem of acknowledging is here at the UNFCCC, I think it's a question of then the need for a really systematic change, systemic change, the, the, the fact that we can and we should address the root causes of climate change. I mean, in the current text, there is no mention of fossil fuels as such. Um, if we don't tackle the root causes of this global problem, how are, are we going to solve it? And putting a human rights uh, approach and lenses to it pushes even more the urgency of taking action and the, the, also the scale of the action needed. So language, from what I hear, is included in the text, just to recognize, recognize what we're saying here to the negotiations that are ongoing. The question is whether parties will use human rights language as a bargaining chip uh, to trade uh, other elements. Um, and this is something we're really trying to push back on, and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but it's, uh, it's always so upsetting to see that after so many decades of discourse and debates about climate change, human rights, the global response and acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement at the highest level is so slow. Um, so that's why I think these conversations are so important uh, in these spaces and really trying to draw linkages between these rooms and the actual negotiations that often are so much detached from, from the reality on the ground. Thank you, Francesca. Do we have another question? Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first, for this panel kind of discussion. I think it was very, um, it was really an opportunity to, sh to, to share, shed a light on, on a, a region that I think um, we don't understand enough and we don't speak about enough. So thank you very much for sharing. And I guess my question. Uh, follows from some of what was shared um, in terms of countering uh, geoengineering um, uh, tests, to tries, and um, uh, attempts. I was wondering. So, uh, so you mentioned some tries are already taking place. Uh, some in the Sami uh, territories have been stopped. Um, one has been stopped uh, successfully for now. And then. So, and, and just earlier, I was at a side event uh, that was about the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and a woman posed a question about um, the deep seabed. And so she was, uh, there is no convention around that, and so she was asking, so how do, prevent, uh, do we prevent and make sure that we don't take unnecessary risks? And one response from the co-chair, uh, negotiating right now the Global Biodiversity Framework, was that, well, in the target, there is a... Um, something that is related to environmental uh, impact assessment, environmental risk impact assessment, and you were saying that that could be a good tool. So I guess my, my, my question would be, um, do you see, because I feel that uh, once things have started, then if it goes to uh, litigation in a way which seems to be more and more the trend to, to be able to stop a project that would be really a bad project affecting communities and maybe mitigation relating to maybe sometimes also mitigation well i feel that um yeah this is too late right so and then self-determination of indigenous peoples some local community that has not been recognized so my question was have you seen other examples of um projects being able to be stopped beforehand. Um, do you see environmental uh, risk impact assessment as a way to potentially include indigenous experts? Uh, indigenous people experts are also as also being part of that process to be able to um, to assess uh, from various uh, knowledge uh, vantage points. Um, and how do you see that the vision moving forward beyond beyond litigation in your way? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I'm going to start briefly with Pam. 
to give an overview of some of the testing she's seeing and also some of the concerns that in the science view are of, are of deep red flags of what's going on. But then if Susanna or Francesca or Sarah would also, or Doa would like to come in. First on a science perspective. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the, the testing, my understanding actually is that before there was the attempt to do the testing over Sopman in Sweden, there was an attempt to do it over Navajo lands in the U.S. Uh, that was stopped, and the experimenters should have been aware then that this was an issue, and then tried to do the same thing and uh, essentially snuck it in with an agreement with the Swedish Space Agency without any consultation. Uh, again, especially with the Sami Council. Um, and my understanding is that it was actually the Navajo that tipped off the Sami Council, but then also tipped off the entire Swedish environmental and academic community that rose as one, right, to say no. Uh, and that caused it to be canceled. So it's, it's a really good example of indigenous peoples working with each other across borders. I, I would hope that the indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples platform here eventually can be a way that that can happen in a more systematic way. Um, but also then, you know, bringing in others. And one of the things that really offended me about the way that was characterized by some in the self-aid injection community was that they then characterized this, as was said a bit earlier, of, you know, a small fringe group stopping science. And living in Sweden myself, all I can say is it wasn't just the Sami Council, it was a unified academic community and a unified Swedish NGO community, not fringe at all. Um, so that characterization is very offensive in the way we sort of be um, On the science behind it, the reason you will have a very difficult time finding any cryosphere scientists who would support this particular method is because of these feedbacks that we're already fairly well aware of. Uh, I only named one, which is ocean acidification. That is probably the longest lasting, of course. But um, there are also concerns with, if, if you think about it, right, the greenhouse gas effect of CO2 keeps heat in. What we're doing with these methods to reflect sunlight is that we're keeping the heat out. And the Earth system responds in a very different way. And one of the most important ways is you're blocking sunlight. And so the same sorts of times in the Earth's history that are cited for decreasing temperature are also associated with widespread famine in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's because crops don't get enough sunlight to grow. And it is also colder, and so they would not reach the point where they could be harvested. Um, that's one issue. There are perturbances in the Indian monsoon, where you have so many people living. Um, and there's also what's called the rebound effect, right? Because if you're using this to decrease temperature worldwide, but again, that's only the global average. It's not the same in different regions. Um, and then something happens and you have to stop it. You might go from, say, 1.5 degrees to 4 degrees in the space of a year. And that would cause just widespread ecological and, and human damage because there'd be absolutely no way. I mean, even now, species are having a hard time adjusting to our current rise, but imagine a rise like that. So, again, all sorts of arguments against it from a scientific point of view that are very rarely used. Um, so, I would like to turn it over to anyone, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I can respond to, to that. Yes, the, the, this project was going to be conducted over Sami lands without uh, no information nor consulting, consultation with the Sami people. Uh, Sami council was black about uh, these testings and um, which we are very grateful for. And, um, thank you for underlying the underlying the, the research part of that. I'm not an environmental researcher or a researcher within this field, so to even understand 
what this was all about um, was, was, was hard. But um, solar engineering technology puts humans as masters of nature and as masters of the whole world, even the atmosphere, which is completely new and foreign to us and against everything that we have been taught and how we understand and interact with our environment. And solar engineering is controversial and risky, um, with many unsolved questions also regarding ethics, governance and power balances, um, and also with unknown environmental and climatic impacts. So, most importantly, I just want to underline that solar engineering technologies, as we know from now, do nothing to, to address the root cause of the climate crisis, which is important to underline. So, Sami Council's view on these tests was that it is a first step towards legitimizing this solar, um, what, what is the formal term, solar rea radiation management technology to be further developed. And we consider it to, to be uh, in direct opposite of, of what we are, are taught and how to, to respect uh, and treat nature. Because in, in our world view, we are a part of nature and not masters of it. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to underline that. And um, to answer the question also on, on environmental risk assessment and, and inclusion of indigenous people. We see, uh, exactly, we see developments that um, indigenous people, the Sami peoples are consulted um, nationally uh, in, in projects, but there's, there's a difference in consultation when it's just information sharing is not consent. And that's what we really must underline here. Consultation is only information sharing if we don't have the right to say yes or no, which we in fact don't have. So we have seen projects being carried out, um, wind energy parks, parks, mining, um, and all sorts of projects being carried out without the consent of the Sami people. So, thank you. Um, we have Doha virtually would like to speak, but um, before I move to Doha, I just wanted to say you work on the CDD. One of the things we're hearing is that those involved in many of the geoengineering experiments do not have proper inclusion of biologists, scientists who are specialists on nature and the consequences to that. Joel, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment on the last question which referred to the seabed. Uh, now, of course, the seabed is, um, is of vital importance when we speak of the Arctic Ocean. It's one of the world's shallowest, it is the world's shallowest ocean, in fact, and therefore it has the most accessible seabed in the world, uh, and indeed protecting that seabed is important. Uh, in the Arctic, um, uh, the Arctic littoral states, which are the Arctic coastal states, five of them, uh, they have exclusive economic zones and all five of them have tabled, um, or four of them rather, uh, because the U.S. is not a party to the law of the sea, uh, but they have tabled extended continental shelf claims under the law of the sea. Um, so that means that uh, they have sovereignty or will have sovereignty when their claims are uh, confirmed over very large portions of the seabed of the Arctic Ocean. Once you take all of that out of the picture, what is left in the Arctic Ocean is nothing bigger than the Mediterranean Sea, which becomes the high seas portion of the Arctic Ocean that is still a kind of global common. Now, for that portion of the Arctic Ocean, there, uh, as well as for the high seas more generally, there's a new agreement that's being negotiated that's called uh, the Agreement on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. Um, and uh, there are consultations that, that are taking place with indigenous people to see uh, how, you know, what their, uh, what their concerns and, uh, are with respect to biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction and whether there are know-how of the seas of biodiversity can be incorporated into that agreement. But there have been criticisms, of course, of uh, an insufficient, let's say, incorporation of indigenous concerns into that agreement. But it is something to closely watch, of course, because of its impact on the only and very small remaining high seas portion 
exploration of the Arctic Ocean once all of the sort of uh, uh, claims are taken out of the picture, whether the EEZs or the extended continental, continental shelf claims. Thank you. Thank you, and we're just going to move to Sarah, um, and then we have a few last words, Sarah. Yes, I just wanted also to comment on the bio or geoengineering. Sorry, um, there are also projects and, and, and groups of scientists that are interested in, in, in uh, initiating projects that will be fundamentally changing the ecosystems of parts of our coast um, and. Uh, one message that we brought to them is that if you're not invited, then there's not really anything to do there. And I think that that, that is really the challenge in, in, in the communication. And uh, what we see with, with that particular project that I'm talking about is that there's actually none of the national institutions in Greenland who have wanted to partner with this group. So when that happens, it's a very clear sign. When the local government and the peoples of this place are not interested in, in that project going ahead, then that must be respected. Um, and I just want to also to touch upon the issue of the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. In the Inuit Circle Council, we take part in that. And we refer back to the UN uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea as a convention that was done without participation of indigenous peoples. So there is a positive development in engaging with us, still not in a sense that we can actually be taking directly part in the decision making, but I do want to recognize that the International Maritime Organization has uh, provided us or given us a provisional consultative status uh, in these two years uh, and we see that as a fundamental recognition of the knowledge we have of our seas. If you look at the map of the Arctic, we live along the, the long, long, long coastlines of Greenland, Canada, Alaska and parts of Chukotka. So obviously we are deeply dependent on the future of the management of both uh, sea within and outside national, national jurisdiction. So we also take part in another forum where we are not recognized as an indigenous people, but where we can join through our respective states. And that is the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement negotiations, to which there will also be a conference of the parties later, later this month. Our vice chairs uh, and, and, and executive council members, two of them, are on their way to Korea for that conference. So there is, yes, uh, some degree of recognition of having us at the table. And I think it comes from, particularly for the Indian Circular Council, comes from the recognition of the 45 years we have existed as an organization since, since 1977, and the diplomacy we have been able to contribute with, resulting in stronger uh, resolutions stronger declarations, stronger wording that encompasses the complexity of the world in a way that it wouldn't if we had not been there. We were integral parts of the negotiations of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We strategically partner with states that support our rights. So we just want to urge all of the other platforms where decisions are taken to do that as well, because it would only result in a stronger uh, outcome. It's time really to wrap up, so I'm going to ask each speaker to give one message, one sentence, one message for the negotiators going through the night. What is your one message? Okay, my main message would be, I cannot do this in one sentence, so human rights, and especially the rights of indigenous peoples, must be at central, center in these negotiations. It must be parts, a part of everything that is happening within the UN FCCC, as states are actually obliged to. We also need higher ambition and 
more leadership from our political leaders. And, and as of now, I, I don't see that coming, but I really want to hope that we can see societal change coming out from, from these negotiations and this COP meeting, but also the work that we have ahead. Thank you. I think that our classic one is almost a physical reality, which is there's no negotiating with the melting point of ice. And we don't have the right, I mean, to, to think of intergenerational justice, and that we don't have the right to not take into account the human rights of future generations in what we do today. Yes, and I think that in order for states to really grasp that, we should be at the table. Next cup. We should speak into the plenary. We should give our nation's point of view directly to those who negotiate. In the end, we should actually be co-negotiating. Next week, a lot of us will go to Geneva to work on the enhanced participation of indigenous peoples within the human rights system of the UN, pushing for our recognition as peoples, not just as NGOs. So small steps are taken in the right direction and can only urge the states to actually include us at the table and listen to our, our contributions. Thank you. Maybe just one sentence would be that when they negotiate, they should realize that each single word has an impact in real life. So when you talk about fossil fuel, including indigenous people's rights, unabated fossil fuel, these small words that get lost um, in the last hours of the, or not lost, in the last hours of the negotiations actually do have a weight in the real world. So not to be lost. In, uh, this uh, diplomatic uh, world above everything, but actually think of the real implications of what is being negotiated here. Um, I guess uh, my uh, my message to my one message to negotiators is: do not assume you know what climate justice is for indigenous people. Ask them. Speak to them. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all speakers, thank you audience, and thank you for all this work. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.